Hello, Hello and, and welcome. welcome. I'm Delena Sepko. And I'm Trish Kiel. You're listening to I Lassie, which is a three-part series that introduces you to Scottish women's history. We think that there are generations of extraordinary Scottish women who, in their own ways, have helped shape the world we live in now. But we've noticed that some of our heroines have been misrepresented, or almost forgotten, so we're excited to have the chance to tell you about them and their work. In this episode, we'll leave 1928 and jump to today to discuss some of the legacies left by the women we've come across in this series. We want to know how their lives, their stories and their achievements are remembered and find out more about how modern Scottish women are learning and sharing lessons from the past. But why should we pay any mind to things that happened 100 or 500 years ago? Why should any of that matter now? Because the present isn't separate from the past or the future. They're not isolated periods of history with no influence or effect on each other. History is a continuum, and in order to know where we as a society are and where we're going, we need to know where we've been. The best way to know the past is to do the research, to study it and share it. The way Trish and I have done that is to find a person or an event or a movement that we can relate to. Not just something that catches our interest, but something that really speaks to us. Language, culture, and societal values have changed. There's a lot of difference between how we live and think today and how women 100 or 500 years ago lived and thought. But we still have the same hopes and desires. That's not changed. People, both men and women, want to be safe. We want to be well-nourished. We want to be stimulated, mentally, emotionally, and physically, so that we can live and not just stay alive. So even though we think that there's nothing in common with Mary Elizabeth, there is. To find out what exactly it is we have in common, we need to have a look at the legacies left by some of these and other women. To do this, we'll speak with Caroline from the Glasgow Women's Library, the UK's only accredited museum dedicated to women's history. Yeah, uh, I'm Caroline Gosden and I'm relatively new as a member of staff to the library actually. Um, I started at the end of last year as a development worker for um, programming and curating and participation and partnerships, so quite a long <laughs> a long title, <laughs> but I think it's really to reflect the, the, the sort of like multifaceted nature of, what, of the stuff that happens at the library and mm -hmm. they're very keen for things to not get siloed into areas that don't communicate with each other, so my job is to kind of go between different departments, but um, I've got quite a, a history um, with the library apart from working here. I was a, I, I've done a lot of my research I was, when I was at art school. Um, my research was kind of about the beginnings of the library, so I do sort of know it. And okay. I've, so I've, kn I've known the library since it was in Trongate, uh, which is okay. where I first kind of did interviews with um, women who were involved in a, <coughs> a project called the Rule of Thumb Project, which was about um, domestic violence. Um, that was fun. I think it was an award-winning project as well. So congratulations. So um, well, I was just interviewing the women, <laughs> not not winning the awards. They were they were winning the awards. Um, so yeah, I've got this kind of yeah in and outside perspective of like being a researcher and artist in the archive, and now coming here to work really recently. So yeah. Um, well, for for everyone's benefit, can you tell us what Glasgow Library is and what it what it's for? Who is it for? And how did it come about? Yes, uh, so it's a, I don't, I don't know if I want to say that it's a misnomer because it is a library, mm -hmm. so I guess that's first and foremost, but it's also uh, a museum and an archive. Um, it's, it's the only accredited museum of women's history in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's been recently given the title of National Treasure as well. I so heard, yes. Yeah, so it's got, um, got all these different parts and I guess that involves um, the museum 
Um, it, we've got a, a, a big collection of books in the library and it's free to join the library for everyone mm -hmm. and you can there aren't any fines on the books which is always <laughs> worth unusual. saying um, and then uh, we get a lot of people coming into the archives as well to sort of research women's history so um, we've got we've got the kind of purpose-built archive mm -hmm. and we've got mm -hmm. an event space as well and we do a lot of all sorts of different events and um, we do our own series called Herland which can vary between like poetry nights to Kayleys to all sorts of things that are just about celebrating women creatives mm -hmm. um, we also we're a sort of place of lifelong learning and that's that's really at the heart of everything we do so from the as I said the community room that we're sitting in we have like English as a second language courses that mm -hmm. women can attend every every morning so um, and you can also we've got lifelong learning assistants who tutor women individually in that as well and it's about kind of uh, anchoring that learning to women's achievement as well so sort of using our collections and resources and um, we're also an exhibition space so we have artists come in and make shows so we've got mm -hmm. a show on at the moment um, it's dotted about different parts of the building and that's about artists responding to the histories we've got here and making work so yeah <laughs> a little bit more than a library but also a library okay so i get yeah. the library part yeah. that it's library plus yeah um what about the women part is that yes yeah, is, so <laughs> is the is it a, a library about women and women's endeavors yes, or is it a yeah, library so, for women is it yeah that's the bit i i should have uh, that's all right said straight away so <laughs> it's it's all about um celebrating women's achievements okay and empowering women now to kind of like move forward and um yeah like, sort of like thinking about how we can learn these histories that are maybe not spoken so much so yeah that's uh that's the the main thing that drives all the collections um, can women's. men use the library? Yes, uh, the library is for everyone who's interested in women's history um, and women's achievements and celebrating those things okay. as well. So, yeah, we, we kind of we work we work with certain sort of safe spaces as well, which are um, women only spaces for different um, events. Um, but we also do events that are open to everybody, and as I said, you can anyone can join, okay. anyone can come and see the exhibitions. And, what about the Glasgow part? Is because uh, I've I, I'm not 100 percent on the sort of origins and the beginnings of the Glasgow Women's Library. Why Glasgow if it's the only accredited museum <laughs> in the country? Was there anything particular about Glasgow that made it a suitable place for that kind of collection and that kind of attention? Well, um, the origins of the Women's Library are in the sort of 1990s when mm -hmm. um, Glasgow was um, awarded City of Culture. That's right. So um, that's really kind of the, the moment that spurred on these, uh, the original kind of women activists who are still involved, so um, Adele Patrick and Sue John, um, to sort of respond. What, what they were really thinking about was the idea that, you know, the light of Glasgow, the light of the world was going to be shined on Glasgow at this point, and you know what was what was the cultural offering going to be? Mm -hmm. And they, uh, well, I think Adele's quote is, "It looked very stale, pale, and male." <laughs> yes. So she okay. kind of that, that was the beginning of women, the Women in Profile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, project movement, um, which was about saying that there are other there are other things, and you know these things get lost from history a lot of the time. There are other voices to listen to. Um, so they started Women in Profile, and um, there was a sort of um, really key project called Castle Milk Women House, um, which was about kind of in response to the city of culture, sort of making a cultural centre somewhere else, and they located it in Castle Milk. Right. So it was very much about saying, you know, culture is not just in these kind of city mm -hmm. centre powerhouses as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But I think it was always, you know, also about thinking about what sort of support structures you need in order to be creative. So that was about um, creating space for women who might feel isolated, who might not have like the networks or the confidence to be creative. Mm -hmm. So the, the Women House was sort of loosely based on this um, Judy Chicago model of um, women houses, which is about spaces for um, support for female creativity, but also sort of radically different. And then it was located in, I think Castle Milk at the time was the largest housing estate in Europe. Okay. So, um, you know, it had that, that sort of wanting to like um, acknowledge like class as well mm -hmm. in in that in the politics so mm -hmm. that was kind of the 
what at that time was in the women's library, but it was one of the kind of projects at the heart of how the women's library went on um, to be what it is today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's why Glasgow is just a sort of response to a moment. But um, okay. yeah, I mean, Glasgow Women's Library does a lot of work nationally as well. So um, sort of going to different festivals and doing workshops and all sorts of things elsewhere. Okay. So it's trying, it's really, you know, at the, on the one hand, really rooted in Glasgow history um, and really also still interested in sort of local women and, and, and those perspectives, but also um, reaching out sort of to other places and yeah. encouraging other women's libraries. Well, there's, there's, it sounds like there's an eye to, you know, what else is happening around uh, the UK, yeah. potentially what, what else is happening around the world. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so, okay, so it's, it's responding, uh, but not restricted to Glasgow. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. I think, I think right. you know, the hope was that other people would uh, be inspired and start women's libraries elsewhere, and, and people do come and visit because they want to start a women's library, so, Fantastic. you know, it's, uh, I guess that's that kind of context responsiveness that, you know, other people would start it elsewhere, you know, in relation to their own histories as well, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. we've, been, we've been talking a lot with other folks about some of the social campaigns and activism that happened in Scotland around women's suffrage. Um, and we've heard loads of different stories about some of the women involved, about some of the men involved, about the different uh, tactics, so some that were constitutionalist and some mm -hmm. that were militant. Yeah. Um, so we've heard a lot of different things about a lot of different people, mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I would like to know a little bit more about some of the collections that you have here and whether or not there's any connections with those women and those events and, and some of those uh, periods of activism that, that happened in Scotland or maybe even in Glasgow. Yeah, well, we've got, um, in, our, in our archive, we've got quite a big collection of different suffrage um, materials, mm -hmm. and I've, I've brought a few out from... So we've got things that come out a lot, you know, people mm -hmm. are, especially probably because of the time now, people are looking at the suffrage mm -hmm. movement. Because so we were, what, 101 years yeah, now, we're, so we're, last, last year was yeah, the 100-year yeah, anniversary, yeah. at least of the partial uh, enfranchisement, so that was yeah. um, sort of women over 30 mm -hmm. who owned property mm -hmm. uh, were given the vote, but it took another 10 years after that to get everybody yeah. universal suffrage, so everybody could vote. Um, well, over 21, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, um, right. so while we're, we haven't hit that century mark <laughs> yet, um, yeah. we did have a big year last year. Yeah. So there has been a lot of attention mm -hmm. um, for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I guess the question is, what do we have? And what uh -huh. we, so we, well, we've got things like, um, I, I brought a few things like the... Uh, We've got collections of postcards, which are quite interesting. Um, just a little snapshot of kind of different opinions of the time. So these are these are things ranging from. These look like yeah. Uh, so basically, there there are postcards that are reacting against the suffragettes and the suffrage movement. Uh -huh. There are postcards that are very pro, and there are these ones here that I've pulled out first, which. Seems to be kittens. Cats, kittens. So kittens there's on them. probably people commercially uh -huh. benefiting from uh, the movement okay. who aren't taking a, a what side. Were these, <laughs> what were these used for? So would they have been handed out in the street? Would have they been yeah, sent to your pals? I feel like, like yeah, with I feel like dinner invitations on the back of them. Like were they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, around, these have got you know people have used them. They've written, they've written so things. They have. And uh, we 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 kind of very keen for people to get these out and sort of look through them, and they're in their little uh, plastic um, seals to keep them to keep them good. And keep the mucky hands off. <laughs> and then um, so we've got a whole load of those. Those are fantastic. Um, and then things like things like the watch. This is a very large timepiece. It is. It's a beautiful round yeah. glass timepiece with, um, um, with a is that? brass ring yeah. around the outside with a great big uh, brass loop at the top. There's a, is that a man in the middle with yeah, two so babies this is, and this one is each Yeah, so this is slightly like, what is this all about? Because he doesn't look very happy when he's holding No, he babies. doesn't. Babies are screaming. He's got his <laughs> nightcap on and his nightshirt. He looks like he's landed right into it and yeah. doesn't know what to do. So 
possibly not a pro suffrage it's no <laughs> no that, that strikes yeah. me as like this is what happens when yeah. women get the vote your man is left at home to deal with the <laughs> screaming weans yeah <laughs> so yeah so and then so, th so things like that that everyone can sort of look at and then we've got papers of individual um women in, in different parts of the movement so mm -hmm. the suffrage movement and the suffragette Sure. Papers, um, so that would be correspondence amongst each other? Yeah, or? well, this one's an interesting one, and it maybe goes on to your question about how it's relevant now. So mm -hmm. we've got um, Helen Crawford's um, unpublished autobiography. So she was a, an activist, um, mm -hmm. and what, what, what's happened is, like, just last year, actually, we had, a, we had an artist who came over from New Zealand, mm -hmm. and she found out that Helen Crawford was her aunt, and she didn't know Imagine too that. much. Yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> so, lady to be related to? Yeah, so I think it was a sort of unraveling of like, you know, she maybe just heard from her dad that, you know, Helen was called our red aunt. Like, mm -hmm. and then she didn't, when she sort of started to research it, she realized, oh, wow, you know, this, this woman's really influential. Mm -hmm. She's uh, very bound up with communist politics. She's, she writes, she kind of writes this sort of didactic, but very powerful style of text that Fiona was interested in sort of, you know, some of the sentences were really compelling. We've got other books that Helen read where she's underlined bits in them in the margins. Um, so this kind of set Fiona off on uh, this project to make various pieces that were in response to Helen's um, still unpublished um, autobiography. Mm -hmm. So it was also the fact that she, she at first couldn't get hold of a copy. She heard it was there. Mm -hmm. There wasn't access to it. Um, and then she eventually started to kind of take these sort of type, ha hand typewritten blurry pages and transcribe them and mm -hmm. make them up. And she did that with her mother. So there was a sort of lovely kind of relationship in time where she was learning about um, somebody in her family history. Mm -hmm. And then her mother started to transcribe and then became really involved in it as well mm -hmm. and wanted to sort of go onto wikipedia and change some inaccuracies on the uh -huh. Uh -huh. so yeah and and she made these artworks um that were all kind of all over the library including this sort of rock um that i've got here that's got the sentence in the hands of the proletariat so i think it huh. was uh, something that helen had underlined in a book Right, okay. And something that she also found powerful, so she got them, got it printed on these really nice... I see, I see. ...rocks um, that are, yeah, some, somehow related to New Zealand as well. So okay. there's this kind of thing going on, and we've been giving them out, so you can get one when you leave. Fantastic! <laughs> so I think oh. she sort of wanted them to all go back. She made a, a certain number. So I think that's just sort of one way, one sort of piece of our collection... Um, um, that very much kind of works now in in this case with artistic practice mm -hmm. yeah but we've um so there's a lot of you know and, and beyond the sort of collection there's a lot of um, research history groups in here that do the the walks the guided mm -hmm. walks as well so can you tell us a little bit more about these walks yeah so um they've been i mean they're developing they've they were developed in response to the kind of lack of women um, historical figures in our kind of um, physical landscape, so statues mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. So it was about how, you know, these histories were really out of view. Um, and the Women's Library has been developing these for a good 10, 15 years maybe, I'm not sure. Okay. And the first one, which was the West End Walk. And, and it's, it's all about kind of groups of women getting together and doing the research and then lo locating them in different areas of Glasgow. So... We've got one, we've got a, an East End walk, mm -hmm, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. it's really lovely to listen to, I think, because it sort of connects us very well to kind of a lot of, like, fiery women activists. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can imagine it, but that it goes the other way as well, that, uh, that you know, not only do we get connected to them by, by physically being in a place or a place nearby where something might have happened, but... Um, I think that there's a real opportunity for what their work to come and influence us as well. Yeah. Um, yes. and, and that there's, there's something really magical about being in a place, um, even though you might be separated by 100 years, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, there's, that, it's, that it's in the fabric of the city and, yeah, and taking yeah. folk around and, mm -hmm. and showing them seems to be a fantastic way to, to really bring that to life, to, to make that a real thing in a real place. 
and not just a, a name from the history yeah. books. I mean, absolutely, because I think it is about how that gets embedded in our memory. And I think one of the issues with like um, women's names is the sort of forgetting and the processes of trying to remember yeah. the names. And I think being in the places and thinking about those histories in there, it just kind of embeds it in mm -hmm. a good way. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can sort of think of a, an area quite differently and or you can see kind of reoccurring patterns so the the East End Walk when it talks about Brid, Brid, Bridgeton is really you, you can sort of see even when it starts to talk about weaving as a kind of craft that's always had a very radical history mm -hmm. and then it goes into the, like all the different kind of rallies that gathered on Glasgow Green over mm -hmm. the years mm -hmm. and up until you know I suppose the one, the big one that I can remember in recent recent history was the anti-Iraq war one. You know, started there, mm -hmm. so it's like it's, it's nice to kind of listen and hear back. And and you know, a, a lot of the time at the heart of these kind of rallies, women were organising. So right, okay. Um, there's a yeah, so it's it's great to listen. There's um, I'm thinking of one woman, Betty McAllister, who who ran a fish shop, I think. Um, near here and she was always sort of like gathering the fish shop was called the office and she would sort of gather people for different campaigns and things and again that was um, she called Battling Betty I think so she's one of the <laughs> she's just one of the many women who, who come up in those histories um, also it's like a, a nice weed tie in because I think eventually she was um, voted as Scots Woman of the Year in the, in the 80s I think and um, also Adele Patrick has had the Scotswoman of the Year mm -hmm. honour. Your very own. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a nice, it's a nice wee kind of tie-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I, I think about in in doing this and putting all of uh, these materials together and speaking to everybody so far. It makes me really think why, why should why should anybody who's not come across any of these names before or know very much about women's suffrage. Why is this important? Why should maybe they take a little bit more time to get to know them? Um, what is it that maybe we can learn from them? I think it's, um, for me, it's like, uh, it, it's, it's a massive history that, that most people don't know about. And, um, and, I, and I think it's the sort of consequences of like that you know, on an unconscious level where you're so kind of in the world and like there, there aren't any records to mm. say you know as a woman what you've achieved kind of thing you you've been anonymous in statues you mm -hmm. you have certain roles you're kept you you know traditionally you're meant to stay at home or whatever and, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's about like having the confidence to act and somehow I feel that like knowing a history and there'll be you know because it is a, a very large history and even the suffragette stuff is, is quite well known now. We still mm -hmm. know just maybe one or two names uh -huh. rather than, you know, and maybe we won't relate to the, the particular names that, you know, have kind of come up to the top of, like, you know. And, and so it's about, you know, Fiona's journey to kind of figure out that her aunt was one of those names and then she's mm -hmm. got the kind of personal way in. Mm -hmm. But I, mm -hmm. I expect that there's more than one sort of way in to that yeah. history in terms of there'll be sort of, um, working class history is a struggle. There'll be kind of learned women. There'll be all sorts. So I think what what is important is 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 being able to sort of relate that history as, as something that you're part of, and then giving you the confidence to kind of act mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the present moment. It feels like you're kind of supported by that. So I think what the women's library is great at is is sort of figuring out all the different ways that people need supported. And I think often these sort of support structures that make it possible to act are quite invisible. Mm -hmm. So you could be kind of like sort of moving through the world and being quite successful and not realize that it's, it's these histories that have made you confident or, so it's, it's about kind of giving other people, you know, who, who may be more, more on the margins of, of history and those things, the, the feeling that, um, you know the confidence to sort of act as well yeah and I, f I feel it's that kind of thing that's important to learning as well to to kind of go on and learn things you need to sort of relate them to yourself uh -huh. you know you can't you can learn about stuff that's very distant from you but I think those sort of threads of personal connection it's like when we talked about being in the place you know people learn differently mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm. so I think it's really all those things yeah because yeah. <laughs> we've 
we've also seen that it's really difficult to talk about women's suffrage in the UK, let alone in Scotland, alone, like specifically in isolation. That there were so many other uh, forms of social activism and campaigning that were feeding up to and came out of. So it's not it's not an isolated time period yeah, by folks who were only interested in that uh, in that cause and in that campaign. Mm -hmm. We you know we've seen that there was big education movements, women's education, um, a lot of do uh, work done at the end of the 1800s to help get women into. Uh, higher education, to, to medical programs, and to graduate with the same qualification as men. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of work in uh, housing and housing conditions. Um, you know, we have spoken to folks about uh, Mary Barber, yeah, you know, absolutely. Govan's own local hero, yeah. you yeah. know, and so uh, you're kind of, you wonder, well, we keep hearing about Mary Barber, but did Mary Barber really do suffrage? Well, she did a lot of other stuff too, mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's really easy to just try and look at it or to, to want to look at it in isolation, but it's, it's this mix, uh, I, I think, actually, that provides more opportunities for folks to make those connections mm -hmm. because it's so rich, yeah. because it's so dense. Mm -hmm. Dense also means that it's hard to kind of get, get your wee finger in and get a finger hold into the topic. Um, it can be really confusing with all of the organizations, mm -hmm. they've got really long names, yeah. you boil them down to, you know, acronyms and, you know, maybe, yeah. um, you know, they, they have an argument, they split, they make two, you know, and then mm -hmm. this kind of, um, it, but it's, um, it can be a little confusing at times um, and, you know, having small places or, or people, more smaller nuggets to ingest have actually helped me get that foothold into it. Um, maybe it's one woman's story, maybe it's a particular place in Scotland, or maybe it's a particular reaction to something um, that, you know, that really starts to give me a sense of, of what happened there and the work that, that went into all of that. Um, it's, it is, it's a big, um, movable sort of time period with uh, a lot of different contributing kind of concerns and people. Um, and it's lovely that here at the Women's Library that you, know, you have access, that people have access to some of these things, mm -hmm. like that beautiful watch, like uh, uh, postcards, you know, mm -hmm. with, with somebody's actual mm -hmm. handwriting on the back. That makes it real. Mm -hmm. That makes it a thing that actually happened. Um, and it can be really compelling to come and hold it in your hand or read somebody's direct words right out of their diary. Yeah. Um, it's a really lovely resource that, that not just, uh, not even, it's not just limited to women either, that anybody who's interested in these mm -hmm. topics can come and, and engage with those. Um, so I would, yeah, I would encourage everybody to come down and at least come say hello and see what it's all about and have a look at the events uh, schedule that's on maybe yeah. check out one of these walks that happen mm -hmm. both in the west end and in the east end oh yeah we've got a range of walks uh -huh. so we're, we're still developing new ones um so there's a necropolis walk there's an east end walk west end walk mm -hmm. um, we've got specific suffragette walks as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. and um we're developing an lgbt Okay. Heritage Trail at the Fantastic, moment. Fantastic. So yeah. yeah, we've got people come in every Saturday um, to do research on that, and that'll mm -hmm. be launching in the spring as well. Right. And of course, on top of the on top of the walks, we do a lot of um, workshops, events, with performances. Mm -hmm. We we're, we're um, our, our lifelong learning um, coordinator Donna is converting a Muriel Spark play at the moment. So Fantastic. with a group of women. So. There'll be a performance of that, so it's it's all about kind of sort of like taking these historical things and really sort of living them, uh -huh. I guess, and giving them giving them life and yeah, adapting them and <laughs> seeing what talks to you, what doesn't talk to you, and all that. Uh -huh. so. Oh, I think I think that's a good point. Is that sometimes, you know, the the original thing that you you look into, maybe that's not the thing that catches your attention and captures your imagination. That that there might be another way, another another item, another another event, another person that you can talk to that um, can help you get a sense of things. So even if maybe maybe the walks aren't your bag, then maybe come check out one of the uh, events. There's lots of ways to get involved. So Delina, hmm. have you learned anything new 
or different or interesting that you never thought you would learn while you were doing this? I'm not Scottish, right? So when I went to school, we were taught all the things about America, not Scotland. So to be honest, a lot of this was new, particularly all the names and the events, the specifics about what happened in Scotland, particularly with women's suffrage. Yes, all of it has been kind of new, but that's not the part that I've I really felt invested in. And I think that's a good way to describe this. I was looking at the British Film Institute. They have a lovely bit of film archive of early suffrage demonstrations and a moving image from those times. And I was just flicking through them, right? And I was watching videos and I came across one that kind of changed everything, at least the way that I was feeling and approaching all of this. Now I know that there was a lady in London called Emily Davison. She stepped in front of the horse at the Epsom Derby in 1913 and died uh, as a consequence of her injuries. And I, I knew this in a very like abstract, kind of words on paper kind of way. What happened is the BFI has news footage of that event. I wasn't really expecting to have the reaction that I did. And that was all of the emotions at the same time. As a researcher, you need to distance yourself a wee bit from the subject matter and the materials in order to be able to look at things in a mostly objective kind of way. And that's precisely the way that I was approaching this video when I first watched it. All of that went right out the window. As soon as I saw her step out onto the track and literally in the blink of an eye, she was on the ground and that was it. I, I wasn't expecting, emotionally, I wasn't expecting to have that reaction. So overall, the thing that's new or interesting to me is that I actually took quite a lot of this personally, which I hadn't expected to. And that particular bit of footage, that made it real. That made that woman real, that made her actions real, that made the cause and, and the uh, hopes that she had real um, in a way that, that I suddenly felt very connected to. And that's the part that I wasn't expecting. And um, that's a human part. That because, is the human part, because yeah. Because perception is all. What you see, mm -hmm. as long as you, if it becomes real to you, then it is real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You seeing that woman, I mean, I've seen that footage several times, uh -huh. and it's not something that it's not something that you ever celebrate. No, it's no. not a celebration. Please thing. don't get me wrong. It's not, I'm not trying to glorify. No, I wasn't this, thinking that. No, just in case. I, I just I'd say I'd put that. that is if you. If anybody ever watches it I do not think that there's anyone going to stand up saying yippee that was just the thing to happen that was uh -huh. great yeah no but it's not like that it uh -huh. is a shocking piece of film it is and it really brings home what people will do when they really believe in something uh -huh. because their perception is that that it's worth it's, it it's worth, it's worth it. the risk uh-huh and I and like so the thing with with Emily is that no one really knows why she did that or what she was hoping to achieve in, in doing, attempting something like that. But I can't help but think that if you're, if you're contemplating being near horses that are going really, really fast around the track and maybe getting close to them, that major harm, bodily harm or death were very real consequences. And I can't, I can't help but think that she didn't understand that, that that wasn't, that that hadn't crossed her mind. I don't believe um, it. She could not have understood what she was doing because she grew up in London mm -hmm. at a time when the mode of transport was horse. Was horse. Horse and carriage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There is no way, I mean, she was a mature woman and I'd be very surprised if she didn't see some sort of accident at some point in her uh -huh. life. She would have Involving known. a horse, uh -huh. or she'd have heard about it. Getting near moving horses is usually kind of dangerous. It's not the best yeah. idea, uh -huh. normally. Yeah. So, you know, I found this one, albeit quite well known, but this one woman's act to be so relatable that I actually, I sat there and I thought, Delena, would you do that? Would you try that? Is that something that you'd 
do? And I don't have an answer for that. And I'm not saying that that that, that is necessarily a, a, the best option in a lot of times, but, but what it did was really make me think about the commitment and the belief that was driving that and all of the other instances where people put their put their lives, their reputations, their money and everything on the line. That's the part that that really changed the way that I was looking at some of this. It was no longer just stories about women with words in books. All of a sudden it became a real thing that real people did that had real consequences. Women can vote now. All mm. of the things added up and they worked. Um, 1913, they couldn't vote. That's right. No. Whereas my experience was slightly different. Mm -hmm. I, I knew about that footage. I've, I've watched it several times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, it didn't have the same emotional impact to me, for me. My, my involvement started because I was asked to write a 10 minute film, and that was it. About women's history. About Mary Barber. About Mary Barber, okay. Mary Barber. So I wrote a script. I had been doing some creative writing and I wrote a script. And it was just a monologue. Mm. And I put Mary Barber in the middle of it all. And it was just telling the tale of the rent strikes. And I got a friend to be Mary Barber. It took all day to do that 10 minute film. Mm -hmm. But that's what sparked my interest. Because Mary Barber was someone who I didn't know about. No, that's not true. I did know about her, but it was through a, a song that a songwriter friend of mine had written. Mm -hmm. But even then, like you say, that was just words on a page mm -hmm. or words being sung. Yeah. It was more a metaphor than a real person. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I actually had to go and do the research and find out that this woman, actually when she lived in Govan, lives across the road from me. For me, six years on, to be then looking at two queens, I mean, actual royal queens. Mm -hmm. For me, Mary and Elizabeth, they were the beginning. And I like to know the beginning. Mm. <laughs> I like to know the beginning, the middle and the end. Of, well, I'll never know the end of this. Yeah. Is that the part that made it interesting, was finding what you felt was the beginning? Yes, because I'd watched TV and I'd read the stories so I knew what was fed to me. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to go and look at more serious works about mm -hmm. these two women. Okay. Who sort of stripped away. I mean, what do we hear about Mary? We hear about how she met or killed her husband. Well, uh, the part I know is that she lost her head by the end of it. Well, she did. The end yes. of the story. She did. Sorry I... to spoil everything, guys. <laughs> But she loses her head at the end. That's the part yeah, I know. So Mary Queen of Scots got her head chopped off. Uh -huh. And like <laughs> Queen, Queen Elizabeth, the only thing I kind of know, and again, it's in that like words on pa you know pages kind of way, is that like she married England or something because she didn't want, she didn't want a husband. Queen, yes. My sense, and uh, what I'm gathering is that you found out along the way, is that there was more to it than that. Um, uh -huh. That there was something actually that changed ideas about gender and power and politics because these women had this interaction. You know, it makes me wonder, would they have had that if they lived separately at different times? Do you know, would that, it was it something about their combination or about those women in general? No, it was a combination. And also it was the fact that they were ruling queens. They weren't queen consorts. No. They were the rulers. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who had absolute rule over the kingdom that they ruled. Mm -hmm. Their word was law. And this set in motion. And this set in motion, this whole idea of being a woman in power at a time when such a thing was an, an anomaly. The, but not only was it a woman being the anomaly, mm -hmm. there were two women two. living next, next door to each other, uh -huh, uh -huh. kingdom wise. Sure. There were both anomalies in the whole of Europe. Well, <laughs> and that just kind of went, whoa. Yeah. There's, there's something about... What a synchronicity. The coming together of females in power, and, but that's exact females in power, that suddenly those two things weren't mutually exclusive. I mean, albeit there was a heck of a lot of opposition, there were loads of folks that didn't think that that, that was all right, that that wasn't God-given, you know, whatever their kind of rationale was around that. You know, there was still a lot of 
opposition to their being in those okay. in those roles. All you need though is one instance. And in this case we had two instances at the same time wow. of women going, Do you know what? No. I'm in charge. But their autonomy was also constrained by men. No, I'm not saying that that they had absolute free reign wow. because they were the monarch. That you know that obviously set of constraints has its own particular flavor. Um, so you know maybe you're giving up one harness for another. But in this case, that was the only option. Yeah. Um, you couldn't have, you couldn't be a woman, be the monarch, and do whatever you wanted. You couldn't get all three. But I think the important thing that women sort of absorbed, maybe not consciously, but I think women absorbed was that women could rule mm -hmm. and be successful at it. Elizabeth was on the throne for 50 years, I think. Mm -hmm. No, 40 years, something like that. I can't even remember properly now. A while. It was a while, yeah. <laughs> she had numerous attempts, numerous attempts of people trying to murder her. Mm -hmm. she or created, marry her. Just ordinary her. She created kind of the, same thing. the first uh, civil service mm -hmm. and the first like MI5. MF, There's a famous picture of her where the gown is full of eyes. And that's that was right. to show... That's right. And, yeah, and that was to show that she was queen, she had the power, and she had her eyes on you. She was watching. She was watching. That's right. Because she had to watch. Uh-huh. And that's the downside of being a ruler. Because it was a nest of vipers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't, whether you're a, a lady monarch or a man monarch, I don't think that changes. It doesn't matter, no. I don't think that makes a difference one way or another. But you just have this extra cachet, uh -huh. for, for me anyway, yeah. of being a woman. I mean, I've really enjoyed doing this series. Uh -huh. I mean, it's been an excellent opportunity to become more familiar with the, the way that Scotland came at, you know, in my case, women's suffrage. It's been really good to hear about how maybe all of that might have started, I mean, 500 years ago. It's been nice to kind of weave this narrative together and to speak with other people about how they, uh, their take on it, how, how they've been ingesting and sharing those stories. And in some instances, keeping a lot of those legacies alive. You know, so we've been really lucky to have all of that input as well. It's made me realize that there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. Yeah. And it's been a real pleasure to speak to them about it. I hope that you feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. But also, one of the other f fun aspects of it is the conversations that we have had. Uh -huh. Just exploring these themes and these thoughts and, you know, discussing these people that mm -hmm. you have been mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interviewing and what comes from that. And it's just all a great learning curve. It is. And... You know, all along, the purpose of putting this together has been an introduction. You know, it's not a massively in-depth in any particular place in the hopes that, well, in celebrating International Women's Day, in Women's History Month, Happy, uh, Happy Women's, Women's History Day. Month. That's Happy right. Women's History Month. Um, <laughs> you know, and that we can, we can share, even in, in a little bit, in our own quirky little way, some of these women, some of their stories, and some of their achievements. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you, Trish. Thank you, Delina. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute fantastic pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. This thank is, you. This is yeah. I, Lassie, and we wish you a very happy International Women's Day and Women's History Month. We'd like to thank everyone who helped put together episode three. That's Caroline Gausden, Sue John, and Jenny Noble from the Glasgow Women's Library. We'd also like to thank Sunny G Radio, Lisa Donati from Gialaldi, Bryony Cullen, and Kirsty Mooney. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Want to find out more or listen to this show again? Head on over to sunnyg.com forward slash iLassie to play this and other episodes as many times as you like. You can also check out extra materials related to each show. Feel free to get in touch via our Twitter account. That's at iLassieRadio and let us know what you think.